Good morning and welcome to our webinar on fuel quality. My name is Henrik Peterson and I'm the Group Commercial Director of Adon Allen. We have been involved in uh, fuel and fuel infrastructure since the very beginning of the company in 1926. So fuel is very much part of our DNA. And still to this day, fuel plays a vital role in the machinery of society and our economy uh, to make things work and to make things work when other things don't work. So fuel quality is such an essential part of driving infrastructure um, and assets for our customers. And we do this on a daily basis. And in fact, on a yearly basis, we operate probably fuel assets and fuel liquids to the tune of 100 million liters a year. So today, Gary Hickey, who is our director for fuel services in the Adon Allen Group, will give you an update on fuel quality and why it's so important and vital to your operations. So without further ado, I hope that you will learn from the insights of today's webinar. All the best. Thank you. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, thanks, Henrik. Uh, and uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining our webinar this morning in your busy working schedules. Uh, my name is Gary Hickey, as Henrik uh, introduced me. Uh, I spent my entire 45 year career in the downstream fuel industry uh, and a third of that with uh, Adron Allen. During this time, I've seen many changes for the good, mostly in fuel quality, uh, reducing emissions and improving our air quality. Uh, back in the 1970s, uh, petrol had lead content, heavy fuel oils had a three and a half percent sulfur content. Diesels had a half a percent sulfur content or 5,000 parts per million. And uh, coal and coke used in power stations extensively in homes were non-smokeless and created oppressive air pollutions, breathing issues and pea super fogs. Uh, carbon dioxide CO2 air levels in the 1960s were around 300 parts per million. And today between 410 and 420 parts per million which is the highest for our 14 million years. Uh, this causes the planet to heat up at an alarming rate. In the 1970s, again, we had three day working weeks and a succession of power cuts plunging cities and towns into total darkness. Concerned about maintaining power supplies, organizations installed backup fuel storage that can be switched over to run, at diesel, run with diesel at a moment's notice. Probably the biggest change in all those in all those years is the composition of fuels uh, was the introduction of biomass, which is ethanol into gasolines and vegetable oils into diesels. Uh, for today, I'll just be concentrating on diesel quality and issues pertaining to them. Petrols, aviation fuels and kerosene all have their own individual problems, which we may well analyze in the future. Uh, it may be worth noting that the UK is the seventh largest user of diesel worldwide. Uh, regulations, uh, well, there's lots of them, frankly, uh, and directives. We're not only uh, governed by our own uh, thoughts about how we look after the planet, but there are uh, EU and UK regulations and directives which we have to adhere to for fuel and air quality. These are just a few samples. Uh, that uh, of, of many, uh, 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 I won't go into any detail into any of them, but if anybody suffers badly from insomnia, uh, I can quite easily send you the links to these mighty tomes. When you start reading some of the length of these, of these uh, papers, you'll probably get an idea why Brexit took so long to, uh, to get sorted out. Uh, one thing is for sure, uh, that failure to meet any of these standards for anyone from the producer to the end user can result in quite substantial financial penalties and reputational damage. Uh, the, the slide here shows uh, the British standard for the two grades of diesels that we're talking about today. Uh, the one on the left is, uh, is class A2 BS2869 2011 when it was updated. And uh, the one on the right is Class D, BS2869 2011, uh, that 
Uh, there's 17 parameters on both of these uh, bridges standards, and 16 of them are exactly the same for both of them. The only difference between the one on the left, which is for non-road mobile machinery, which is pretty much uh, anything that moves, uh, earth moving equipment or inland uh, water vessels or tractors. Uh, the difference is the sulfur content maximum is 10 parts per million. Uh, we, we call it in the trade ultra low sulfur gas or virtually sulfur free gas oil. The one on the right, uh, the class D is for uh, static machinery. Any it doesn't move generators uh, and furnaces and boilers. Uh, the difference is the maximum allowable sulfur content for this grade is 1000 parts per million or 0.1 of a percent. Uh, the, this is probably a very straightforward slide showing that uh, what good diesel and poor diesel looks like. Uh, the image on the right hand side uh, is something we encounter often in high throughput storage tanks and uh, clearly shows the diesel above the sludge element at the bottom is very cloudy and uh, we'll explain why that's happened later on. Uh, so what causes the problems? Well, typically uh, high turnover, high throughput tanks, uh, they may be distribution centers or forecourts that receive multiple annual loads of fuel, lots of deliveries of fuel. Uh, each load uh, naturally has contaminants within it, obviously all within British standard spec, but the more every load that goes in introduces more contaminants into the tank. Uh, so uh, that's quite a common cause of, of, of uh, high contamination within the tank. And on the other spectrum, there's the low throughput tanks, uh, fuel that's really used, probably store for power backup generation. Uh, maybe there's a, a monthly run for, on the fuel to, to, to fund a generator uh, that uh, maybe get topped up every now and again with, uh, with newer fuel. Uh, these tanks, uh, these tanks have a big problem of degradation over over many years and we'll, we'll get to that again later and uh, the last point of the problem is is basically your your tank husbandry your infrastructure maintenance on your tank uh, fuel storage terminals large fuel storage terminals have a meticulous uh, regime of, of draining water from their fuel tanks on a daily basis they understand the issues that uh, having water in the tank can cause to the quality of fuel uh, and also they'll, they'll regularly clean the tanks uh, on, a, on a set basis every year, two or three years. So uh, that uh, we also need to not only look at the water in the tank, we look at the general condition of the tank, the pipe work, the seals, the gaskets, the wear and tear and leakage. Uh, we might even consider putting these tanks under uh, an air pressure test and all the associated pipe work to uh, test for the strength and the, and the leaking potential within those uh, infrastructure. Uh, early indicators, signs of, uh, of a problem. Well, there's, there's a few, not least uh, smoking. You know, your, your uh, boiler, your engine or generator will start smoking excessively and, and you'll notice a, a, a bad odor coming from that. Uh, you'll have uh, issues starting It'll take longer to start your boiler or generator or engine uh, because of uh, issues potentially within the fuel. You'll start burning more fuel. Uh, if, if you keep a, a track of it, you'll, you'll notice that the fuel consumption increases. And uh, you'll see the horror pictures on the right hand side of, uh, of uh, fatty gum deposits that get onto injectors and, uh, and uh, filters. Uh, that will uh, prevent, uh, prevent uh, fuel getting to the place where you need it to be. And uh, blocked filters, well, that's that's probably one of the first things you'll notice is that uh, you're changing filters regularly. Filters, uh, uh, fuel is filtered regularly from the fuel storage terminal, three filters on a fuel tanker. You'll have uh, filters on the tank itself and, and in the pump if you're pumping the fuel and even in the end of the nozzle of, of the pump you're pumping it from. Uh, when these start blocking up, the first sign is probably a, a slower fuel delivery 
you'll find that you know, the fuel is taking longer to get to where you want it to. Uh, and it's worth mentioning also running issues, general running issues. Uh, modern engines uh, have been uh, evolved to, to, to run on, uh, on today's fuels. And uh, we have now what's called a, a common rail system where injectors uh, atomize fuel into the tank rather than the old engines, which rather squirted it in, into the tank. Subsequently, the holes that, that uh, are used in the injectors are much smaller and uh, more susceptible to blockage. Um, and we'll go to some of the causes. Well, water. Uh, water is the enemy of, of biofuel blends. Uh, it's, uh, it never used to be an issue, particularly where water obviously being heavier than fuel would uh, drop to the bottom of the tank and provided your, uh, your outlet pipe where the fuel left the tank still had uh, fuel in it and the water was below that, you never really experienced any issues. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about how biofuels in a, in a moment affect uh, storage tanks. And, uh, and water is, is the enemy, it really is. There's, there's two types of water you'll find in a tank. Uh, one is free water, literally, that sits at the bottom of the tank. Uh, it, it's heavier than diesel, so it will always find its way to the bottom. Uh, this free water can get into the tank through a number of reasons. It might be uh, poorly sealed vents at the tank top or lids, and uh, probably more likely with condensation. Uh, the alleged space in the tank uh, above the level of the fuel and below the tank roof is, is a breeding ground for condensation. You'll get water droplets growing on or on the side of the tank that will ultimately drop to the bottom of the tank. Uh, the other type of fuel is entrained or saturated water content. Uh, this is uh, held within the fuel. It's in the body of the fuel and uh, the You'll see the photos there of the uh, strawberry milkshake, very emulsificated uh, gas oil on the left hand side, which has over 200,000 parts per million water content. And uh, at that stage, obviously, that, there's not many engines that will be able to burn that fuel. And uh, the progress from left to, to right is, is how we could treat that with a, with a fuel polishing exercise. But you, you really don't want your fuel getting into, the, into that state. Uh, the British standard maximum for water content in diesel is 200 parts per million. But uh, diesel is, is typically delivered into your storage tank at between 50 and 70 parts per million. So uh, there, there, there's an element of water always within diesel. And uh, you'll find that uh, every time you put that fuel into the tank, a modern engine will burn this fuel quite happily. Um, you're, you're, you're always introducing water into a tank but you're always trying to make sure that's below the British standard of 200 parts per million. Uh, another cause and, uh, and uh, one that's been ongoing for some time is, is microbial contamination or activity. You know, it's quite commonly known as the diesel bug. Uh, these, these are aerobic and anaerobic bacteria that live in the interface above the free water in the tank bottom. And, and the fuel above it. Uh, colonies of bugs can multiply very quickly, often doubling in size every 20 minutes. Uh, the bugs don't live very long, maybe two or three days, and then they'll drop to the floor uh, of the tank, forming a sludge layer. This sludge, apart from blocking filters, which it will do, uh, is a perfect environment for producing hydrogen sulfide, which is highly corrosive and will attack steel tanks readily. Biocides, uh, often talked about in our industry uh, as a cure all for, you know, an answer to it, the diesel bug. I, I'm, I'm personally not particularly wild on biocides as uh, they're, they're not a magic formula. They, they won't make sludges disappear in the tank. They will kill the bugs quite quickly. But in some cases, uh, this will uh, speed up the process of your sludges in the tank. So uh, they, they don't don't get rid of sludges, but they, they will kill uh, bugs quicker than, than normal. Um, quite a hot topic. Uh, this one is, is fame content, fatty acid methyl esters. Uh, these were uh, introduced into uh, diesel 
in 2008, uh, with the, the obvious reason to uh, get some sustainable vegetable oils into diesel and, and uh, move away from our, uh, our, uh, our dependency on, on normal fossil fuels. Um, this was driven by the RTFO, it's the, uh, the uh, Renewable Transport Fuel Obligation, uh, which is obviously trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, fame in biodiesel was sourced from a number of, of different feeder crops, uh, not least rapeseed oil or palm oil, uh, sunflower, soya, and even uh, recycled chip fat oil. Uh, it's quite common in the UK, actually. Uh, there are concerns about growing these crops for fuel use, usage, uh, not least deforestation and a reduction in food crops production. But that's uh, certainly for another seminar webinar not not by me i'm sure uh, in 2019 january 2019 the maximum fame content in diesel uh, raised from five percent to seven percent and is due to rise to eight and a half percent during 2021 in the uk uh, in south america they got a bit of a jump on us and uh, 10 to 12 percent fame content is commonplace uh, and in brazil and argentina they're set to rise this to 15% in a year or so. Uh, Biodiesels, the, the element of biomass within the diesel, has a very strong cleaning effect. Uh, and it's a very effective solvent. So you will find that it'll strip residues from tank surfaces higher up in the tank and, and uh, increase the sludges on the tank floor. Uh, methyl esters are typically very hydroscopic. Uh, meaning they will absorb water very easily. Uh, every time refineries increase the fame content, uh, even though in 2019 January 7% was allowable, uh, it wasn't really until the spring of, of last year that 7% became the norm for delivering into, uh, into diesel. And uh, we had a, an outbreak of uh, filter blocking, an epidemic pretty much, that, uh, that sprang through the country. Uh, there was all sorts of issues with uh, with fuel storage tanks uh, not being able to be used. Uh, there was government intervention. There was focal focus groups from the fuel industry talking about how to alleviate it. And uh, the pictures in the slide here uh, show some of our attempts at uh, of taking fame out of fuel and what they would do to one of our nappy filters. Um, it's, it's, it's a nasty deposit, it's very fatty. This is like, it'd be pretty much like leave a chip fat out. You know, it's that sort of um, uh, glistening sort of product that, that will, will block a filter very readily. Uh, also with, uh, with the fame content of the vegetable oil, it's, uh, it needs special attention in colder climates. 100% uh, fame content, 100% palm oil will uh, need to be stored at about 40 degrees C and stirred on a regular basis, it, it's it quite readily in colder conditions will, will become very heavy and set to a jelly. So uh, we obviously we have to look at that as well in the spring. There was no, no, uh, no, no real thought that the fact that the weather was colder and, uh, and, and these filters started blocking up at that point. Uh, another issue we had with fame during that time was uh, we call it phase separation. Uh, no one actually, I don't think has ever worked out why, but fuel was delivered in uh, to tanks at the maximum 7% allowable limit. But for some reason, it was dropping out of, of the, the fuel. In other words, you would find that the, the top level of the tank was maybe 4 or 5%. In the middle, it was 7 or 8%. And in the bottom, we discovered uh, fame content, of, in some cases, over 20%, which is uh, obviously not ideal because uh, that's where you're drawing your fuel out of the tank from the bottom. So that was one of the reasons why we had lots of problems with, uh, with fame back in the spring. Uh, other causes, uh, inorganic material, uh, well, basically uh, rust particles, uh, uh, not helped by the hydrogen sulfide we talked about earlier. Uh, they, uh, the, th the thing with uh, rust, it, it can get quite small particles, but they'll, they'll a, a typical, uh, a typical filter would be uh, a 10 micron filter that you'd use in the tank. And uh, we, 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 you, you could find that, uh, that 
rust particles of six or seven uh, uh, micron will get through those filters, but cause considerable damage to a uh, to to engines and the like by uh, by abrasion, which we'll talk about. Uh, the cetane rating or cetane number, uh, cetane in diesel is the equivalent of octane to petrol. It's not often talked about actually as a as much as octane is anyway, certainly. And uh, the British standard is between 45 and 55. Uh, simply put, the higher the rating, the easier and more efficiently the fuel will ignite and burn. Uh, this is called auto ignition. And a low cetane rating is often the cause of poor starting, certainly in colder conditions. Uh, it's worth noting actually diesels have a, a shelf life of only 18 months and uh, you, you'll find uh, a reduction in cetane rating or number in, in older fuels is, is basically losing its mojo. Uh, lubricity, uh, there's natural lubricating properties within diesel protects pumps and, and injectors from wear and tear. Uh, the process of removing sulfur and aromatics from fuel then uh, dramatically reduces effects. So uh, the fuel manufacturers have to make sure they've got additive packs in, into their fuel to, to combat this. Uh, Abrasion, well, again, uh, high ash content or inorganic material, rust, uh, can in, uh, dramatically increase, increase the wear and tear on and any moving parts. Uh, sulfur dioxide uh, is uh, sulfur content. I mentioned earlier the two different types of sulfur content within the diesels. Uh, sulfur itself is a serious lung irritant, is a major precursor to acid rainfall. Uh, since 2009, the reduced sulfur levels have been in place, although uh, some organisations were granted some exemptions to uh, for a few years to use up their old stock of, of fuels. Uh, the Environmental Agency are the governing body overseeing sulfur polluting our air and uh, certainly have the power to enforce large penalties for improper use. I think so what can be done? So uh, well, all, all is not lost, absolutely all is not lost. Uh, we, we always think that the first port of call before rushing in to do any remedial work is, is to get a health check or MOT on, on your fuel that you store. Uh, you know, understanding fully what that fuel has been doing sitting in your tank. Uh, this will not only tell us whether the fuel is fit for purpose uh, and is in within the British standard parameters, but will also act as an early indicator of potential fu future problems. Uh, engineers will gain dead bottom, middle and top samples of fuel, depending on the size of the tank, and look for any free water on the tank bottom. Uh, it might be also a time at this stage while they're on site is to do a bit of a, uh, an oil storage uh, regulation audit on the tanks uh, while they're there. It makes perfect sense to me anyway. You'll see some photos uh, on the left hand side of uh, what typically we will find from a, a bottom sample of fuel and you'll see the uh, well, you obviously the layers there with the, on the, the picture of the, of the jar on the right hand side you'll see the sludges at the bottom of the water sitting above that and at the interface where the bugs are growing and uh, the fuel sat above that. Um, it's, it's, it's quite important to actually uh, get these tests done quickly and into the lab and tested quite quickly because uh, if, if, you, if you don't do that then the, the also, you know, the, the bugs themselves may die off and you won't get a, a true reading of what's actually happening in the tank. Uh, on the right hand side, you'll see uh, typical tank sludges that uh, we will find in the in the bottom of a tank after we've uh, after we've uh, done some remedial work for them. Uh, so uh, we, we've, we've sampled the fuel, we've, we've got it into, into suitable jars, we know where it's come from and uh, we, we'll take it into a new CAS accredited approved lab uh, and the test testing we'll do with that will depend on a number of things not least uh, what the operational issues have been reported on uh, what what problems uh, we've encountered or that your, our clients have encountered on the site and and also the evidence in the sample jar what it looks like uh, there's a whole suite of tests we can do but we tend to be specific about what we what we're testing for depending on what we think the issues might be uh, so uh, with the microbial contamination report, it, it, it will take uh, four or five days of incubation period. What we do, we accelerate 
what uh, will happen you know change over a year or two to a to a four or five day period and if there are any bugs that are lurking at that point we can uh, we can find out what they would happen in what happens to them in a year's time or so uh, from the test results we can uh, either have uh, peace of mind that your fuel is robust and is up and fit for purpose or if there are any issues we, we find that they you know uh, that don't make bridge standard spec then we can recommend some remedial actions. So uh, some of the remedial actions, we've got some issues with our fuel. Uh, quite a common one is uh, fuel polishing, which is uh, I always think quite an unusual term when you're talking about a liquid, but it's, it's basically the removal of known contaminants and reconditioning of fuel through a series of filters, spinners, magnets and other material. Uh, once the test results are known, a polishing rig can be set up to concentrate fully on the issues within that fuel. So there's lots of moving parts in a, in a, a modern polishing rig and they can be set up exactly for, for what needs to be done on that, on that particular job. Uh, eight or nine years ago, uh, Adler's uh, had this very fancy video of fuel polishing uh, uh, produced. And uh, it, it, at the time it showcased our cutting edge technology but uh, looking at it today, which I did a few day, days ago, uh, the equipment looks very dated and uh, it's not something we would promote now. Um, po polishing techniques have evolved and developed along with the, the fuels that we're, we have to polish. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of effort that's gone into uh, uh, changing our, our fuel polishing techniques to, to meet modern standards. Uh, you'll see this on the slide here, you'll see some photographs on the left of red diesel and white diesel. On the left hand side or the sort of next door to it sorry uh, the cloudiness is, is almost always uh, a high in trained water content uh, you'll see uh, that uh, probably the diesel the white diesel one on, on the right hand side there has probably got something like a, a 500 to a thousand parts per million and, and the, the, the after effects of polishing will reduce that way below the 200 parts per million which is standard spec uh, fuel polishing uh, is, a, is a brilliant thing and it, it will reduce flame content, microbial activity, water content, inorganic matter and lots of other things, but will never reduce uh, sulfur content, which would require a, a full re-refining process to sort out. Uh, your uh, Adler Allen, uh, as, as a company rule almost, would, would only uh, recirculate polish. What I mean by that, it means that we, we, we use the fuel in the tank to, to at one end, we put the, the pipe in, suck the fuel out of the tank in through a polishing unit and put it back into the other end of the tank and continue that process. We'll only do that with, uh, with fuel volumes of up to 3000 litres. Uh, the reason is we, any more than that, we can't guarantee that all the fuel has passed through the, the polishing process. Uh, for larger volumes, uh, what we, what we do is we uplift the fuel onto a, onto a fuel tanker and then we uh, we polish the fuel back from the tanker through a reconditioning rig back into the tank. So we are confident that we know that every litre has been processed. Uh, on our modern rigs, uh, we have uh, some uh, quite uh, clever particulate counters. Which you can't quite see there, but it, it'll show that the improvement of the fuel on the way through and uh, we can also bring some uh, lab equipment to site to test for conformity, uh, certainly you know, with uh, artificial water testers and the like. Uh, following on almost from, uh, from fuel polishing is tank cleaning. Uh, if your tank has not been internally cleaned for many years, uh, once the tank has been nominally empty, which is probably the only time it will get as low as that is, is during uh, that process where we're emptying the fuel out, uh, you'll often find situations like we found here with our client on the left hand side uh, with heavy sludges in the tank uh, that uh, we all agreed it wouldn't be a good idea to put our lovely clean polished fuel back into that tank again. So uh, the, on the right hand side is an example of, a, of that tank after it's been cleaned out. And uh, we have a nice clean tank and we have lovely fuel going back into it and you'll have a free uh, uh, peace of mind for a long time to uh, to ensure that your fuel is going to be fit for purpose. Uh, if the tank could be uh, manually entered under confined space regulations, this is by some way 
the best method of, of uh, that's depending on the size and the, the lids, but uh, it's, 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 it's a great time to actually clean the tank and also to look over all the tank surface for any uh, degradation. There may be some rust particles growing up in the tank that you might not necessarily see. Uh, there are alternatives to, to diesel on the market, uh, always being experimented. You know, back in the 1970s, the only electric vehicles uh, I knew uh, were milk floats. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, uh, the increase in, in electric vehicles and their practicality has, has been enormous over, over the years and sure to uh, sure to increase, uh, not to be included, not to be confused with e-diesels, which is actually uh, ethanolic diesels, ethanol being put into diesel. Ethanol is is uh, is is put into petrol, so ethanol to petrol is is uh, the vegetable or to diesel. Uh, so uh, it's been developed by Audi over the years and and many others, uh, and uh, ethanol uh, has its own problems within diesel. Uh, not least the fact that uh, it has a much lower flash point than diesel. So there, there, there could easily be some uh, issues with uh, safety and uh, because you're dealing with a lower flash and more volatile product and also uh, with some starting issues. Ethanol it itself can be produced from uh, sugar cane or sugar beet, corn, barley, all of, all of which are sustainable. Uh, and uh, it's, it's something they're looking at quite closely. Ethanol is a particularly difficult product, very hydroscopic, loves water, it will drag it from the bottom of the tank into the body of the fuel. Uh, and it actually, it's a very difficult process to actually remove that from the body of the fuel. Fuel polishing with, uh, with petrol uh, is still being developed to try and sort this problem out. Uh, four core operators. Um, understand this issue in petrol tanks and, and uh, uh, have the same sort of regime as, as fuel terminals for, for taking water out of their bottom of the tank so they don't ruin their valuable asset above it. Uh, other alternative fuels are hydrogen fuel cells, you know, they, they've been talked about and worked on for years, as is uh, natural gas and propane gases uh, that, that can run uh, engines. Also have uh, HVOs, Hydro treated vegetable oils. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a very hot topic at the moment and uh, one that uh, uh, we like very much and, and uh, it's a fuel for the future for sure. Uh, there are lots of advantages uh, over regular fossil fuels, not least that uh, it's uh, renewable and sustainable. So you know, it's, it's not being dug out of the ground, it's something that can be uh, produced time and time again. Uh, it has these fuels have been tested uh, and approved by all the major, major engine manufacturers. Uh, uh, hugely reduced CO2 emissions, uh, you know, which is obviously a, uh, something that everybody's looking at at the moment. Massively reduced CO2 emissions. It's got a very high cetane number. Biodegradable. Uh, will not produce microbial contamination in its, in its, in its raw form. Uh, it's an excellent cold filter, plug-in point capabilities, you know, great at starting at lower temperatures. Uh, it cuts greenhouse gas emissions subsequently. Uh, and it kind of shows that your organisation uh, taking your green credentials seriously, your carbon neutrality takes it very, you know, it, it, it's a perfect product for that. Uh, there are one is one downside that I can think of, and, that, and that's the, the cost of it. it. It is more expensive than regular diesel, but uh, offsetting against all those other products, all those other advantages, I think that's a small price to pay. Uh, we are going to uh, producing another webinar uh, on alternative fuels, and this one in particular. So uh, hopefully uh, you might be interested in coming along and listening to some uh, experts in the field talking about all the advantages of it and uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep you posted on that the way through. So uh, in closing, in summary, um, I think the key is initially to understand what issues we have with our fuel uh, uh, that we're storing and using. Uh, we need to keep on the right side of the law and uh, we make sure we're not polluting the atmosphere unduly. Uh, Regular sampling and testing is critical as the first step for this. Once we understand 
what our fuel is doing and the condition of it in the tank, then we can take we can take next steps to uh, to eradicate any issues that might might, help, might follow. Uh, well, many thanks for listening. Uh, uh, I hope uh, there's some uh, interesting points there for, for future discussion, and uh, we may have uh, other uh, topics to discuss at a later date. Does the fuel policy increase the lifespan past the 18 months lifespan as a rule? Uh, it, it certainly helps it, certainly, you know, so uh, it, it'll, 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 it'll put fuel back, providing the sulfur content is, is a, 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 a low level and below the British standard spec, it will invigorate the fuel back into a, an extra lifespan, absolutely. If left on its own, I think the fuel companies all agree that 18 months is, is a maximum lifespan of the fuel. So yeah, absolutely. I think that's a that's a, a point. Uh, another one. Last autumn, we had huge issues in East Anglia with fuel contamination, which is made up by the fame content. Really, why well, I, I touched on that earlier. Uh, since 2020, we've only had one complaint. Uh, why do you think that has changed? Well, that's a very good point. Uh, well, the, the first thing is uh, it's been a particularly mild winter. In 45 years, probably the mildest I, I, I know, I remember. So uh, again, the fame has a, a problem with when it gets uh, colder. So we had a nice warm winter and it's been warm ever since. So I think that's that's part of it. Uh, the We never know as, as fuel buyers particularly what that fame content is within the fuel. We don't know where the source came from. Which is quite a weird thing really, because we understand the hydrocarbon side, the 93% of the fuel very well. You know, like, you know, every single bit of that, it has parameters and, and, and maximum and minimum settings you know, that we have to adhere to. And yet this 7% almost mysteriously comes in and is put into the fuel that we don't really understand where that's come from or, or the quality of it. Uh, so uh, I think there was talk when we had these issues last uh, last spring, and uh, sorry, last autumn, I apologise, uh, was uh, we were going to the oil companies were looking at reducing the the the, uh, the amount of fame they were putting in in fuel just to see if that made an issue. Uh, we we still we still sample fuel all the time and and, and look at the fame content, and and we're still we are seeing it reduced from seven percent, which was was quite common back in the autumn. And now we're seeing three and four or five percent speed common, so that it might be they just reduce the uh, the fuel, the fame content within the fuel. But it, it, it's certainly something that, uh, that coming into the winter we all need to look at, and uh, hopefully uh, the oil companies have made uh, provisions to make sure that their 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 their, their fame content is, is up to standard. Uh, another question is: uh, Are there any plans for reducing sulfur content? in static machinery uh, below the 1000 parts per million presumably you're talking about that well yeah that um, i think there probably will be i think it, it, um, it's unusual really that in, in 13 years we still have these two specs of fuel the 10 parts per million and the and the thousand parts per million i think uh, going forward potentially that thousand parts per million sulfur content will come down to to one grade uh, it, it's, it's worth Noting actually that uh, often, if if you can burn one thousand parts per million of fuel, and and your fuel supplier knows that and you've asked for it, there's probably every chance that you're only getting ultra low sulfur diesel delivered in a higher grade, lesser sulfur content. The reason is because it's it's too costly to store the two fuels. So um, even though you have the ability to burn a thousand parts per million, you're probably getting the, the lower grade or sorry, the lower sulfur content fuel. Uh, I think uh, that's kind of where we are. I think hopefully uh, I haven't taken up too much for your day and uh, that uh, we, we've got something out of this. Hopefully uh, any questions or answers you may have, uh, I'm sure we can uh, we can answer those uh, at a later date. Thank you very much for listening and uh, back to you, Susan. Thank you, Gary, and thanks to everyone for watching today. Um, we hope that it's been valuable. Um, thank you to Henrik for his introduction earlier. 
we're going to be sending a recording of the webinar to everyone um, this week. And if you have any further questions, please do contact Gary. Um, his details are on the screen. Our next webinar in August will be discussing the implementation of REACH UK on the chemical industry. Please look out for those emails and social media posts with the sign up details and we hope to see you there.